about QA and like why you need QA people and why you need them now. Uh, first of all, like welcome to Drupal South and it's great to be here. Uh, great to have you guys. I, it, let's, let's see how it goes and how you guys are going to feel about the, the talk. Uh, my, first of all, my name is Daniel Carvalinho and yeah, any variations of that so don't worry about pronouncing my name. Even Brazil, I, I'm from Brazil, and even Brazilians don't get it right. So yeah, whatever. I'm living in Australia like for the last around two years, and I've been working with Acquia as a technical account manager for like two months now. Uh, on Drupal, I'm DSCL, contributing, translating for Portuguese, and reviewing stuff. Uh, been working with PHP for around 20 years, and Drupal 10 years this year. And all of this is just to say that I've seen, like, oops, I've seen things and that, that you wouldn't believe. Uh, first of all, we are going to go through a little bit of history, like a, a little story on the QA thing. So once upon a time, there was a digital agency. And this digital agency was having like a normal day and uh, they received an RFP. So yeah, RFP, great, let's see the budget. Yes, let's get this money. And uh, so what they do is basically they put like maybe, I don't know, sometimes the managing director doing stuff or maybe they will call just a digital producer or digital, uh, project manager to look at that. And lots of times they will create the proposal just asking the developers over Slack on the technical bits that they've never seen before. And yes, they will get a proposal ready and they will send the proposal and discuss and et cetera and they will get a contract. And once they get a contract, they sign and et cetera, they go, oh, now that we have a contract, now that we have the deal done, now we are going to think about people. No, sorry. <laughs> and, and so we are going to discover, like thinking about people, what do we need to do? Like what we are really doing in this proposal? So, now I will get like a technical lead or somebody involved to really look into the, the RFP again and make sure that the guy that sent the proposal didn't mess up, right? So yeah, they go over a little bit and then they get to a, a estimated schedule and they think about who, is they, who are they going to involve. So team allocation. Ah, what about we just get like a one backend developer and then we get one front end developer? And what about like the technical lead or the architect or the project manager? Ah, no worries, they are juggling like 10 projects now. Right now they can deal with a, another one, it's not a problem. But okay, and who is going to test it? Nobody thinks about testing. Uh, usually, think. Usually they think, and then in the proposal, testing is like 20% extra over everything. Not really a QA person. So yeah, the backend guy will test whatever he does by himself, and yeah, it's cool. And the front-end guy is going to test he, what he have done, and it's all good. And then whenever everything is put together, that PM that has other 10 projects is going to go over everything and make sure that everything is working because he has a lot of time to do that. Okay, and what about code review? Who is doing code review? Uh, do we need that? And UAT, do you have time for user acceptance test? Are you involving the client at some point? Uh, nah, yeah, site goes live. All good, perfect. And you guys, like, it's something that happens and happens a lot. I don't know if you, if you guys say that you, you've never seen it happening, you are probably lying because it, it did happen and you did see it. And the thing is that whenever it gets online, it, the client comes back and starts to say, oh, there are many things wrong in this layout. How did it pass? And then, there are key things in the site that is, are, they are not working. How, who did test this? And this is like extremely slow. So we need to do something. So you have a less chance. 
you need to get this site ready in four days. All good, all bugs fixed, fixed and everything running perfectly, or there will be consequences, probably legal, probably financial only, whatever. So yeah, what, what do the PM or whatever, whoever believes that is in charge now do? He goes there and gather a lot of resources. Like, so they prepare the team for madness. So everybody is working the full four days over and over, over time, doesn't matter. If you want to rest, you rest in your table and just do it because we need to get it done. Yeah, but there is light in the end of the tunnel. The, tunnel. the thing is that three things that get the, the uh, client very, very unhappy are the delays on the deliver, which usually lead to extra costs, or usually when, depending on the contracts, right? Like there are contracts that the extra time actually leads to cost for the agents, not for the client. But in the end, the agencies to meet the time and the cost, they will end up with lots of bugs. So you are going to get a site live, but there will be a lot of stuff that is going wrong. So what do you do for avoiding this? this? You, go f you, you need to prepare a QA strategy. And things that are going to usually fail on a project like, and lead to that issues are things like estimates done wrong. And lots of times estimates are done back in the proposal. And whenever it gets to the, the, the discovery phase or whatever you want to call that part, uh, what happens is that the team try to meet the estimate instead of reviewing the estimate and like saying, yes, this was wrong. You need to go back to the, the client and say, this, we didn't expect to do this, this and that, and you need to change that. And I'm assuming like that most of people here like working on some sort of agile process, not any waterfall or things like that. I don't believe there will, there is still a lot of uh, agencies doing that. I know there are, but not a lot of them. Uh, and the second thing is the, like I said, like whenever the guys are doing the proposal, they think about like adding QA as a percentage of the, the, the project instead of adding QA as a person that will go, is going to be available for testing it. So in the end, the strategy doesn't really uh, exist because you add a percentage and whenever the, the client come back and say, oh, this is too expensive, you go there and take the 20% becomes 10%. That 10% becomes 5%. And who, yeah, you don't need QA anymore. So the first, part, the first point that loses um, budget and loses time is the QA. Because yes, everybody can test it. So you don't need the, the thing like, to be uh, specific for that. And then this leads to the fact that you have insufficient allocation of people. You don't have anybody there for really taking, like really caring about the testing of the, the project itself. And too many changes. But too many changes I just added there. But in reality, if you think about Agile, too many changes are hard to define because you are supposed to be able to adjust you just need to make sure that the, the client understands that whenever they add something, something is going to go out and you need to manage that. So yeah, if they change it, yeah, whatever, it will take more time, but uh, something else is not going to be done. So yeah, maybe too many changes are not, is not like something that you need to consider. And how uh, usually there are three ways that agencies deal with this. Agencies basically the managers, right? So there is a the variable culture. So the idea of the variable culture is that quality is just a variable there. They don't really care. It's not really the, their responsibility to, to care about the quality of the project. Their responsibility as a manager is like just deliver the project, not with quality really. So this is one way of dealing with that. And 
the problem, the, all the problems that arise, like they will be like just solved as they come. Nobody will really track that. Maybe sometimes problems will, will come and, and somebody, and nobody will go, is going to track it. So it will get lost and then it will get to production. And then the client is probably going to find it later on. The second one is like, is just routine. So the managers basically agree that quality is important, but they don't have the budget because they probably cut it. it like they, they have cut it whenever the client had like asked for discounts. So yeah, the, there, is n there is no more budget for dealing with QA. So we just move on and go for it. And whenever uh, things happen, they will track it, but they will just like act for real in the critical parts. And so whenever they act on the critical ones, they will be, oh, okay, so critical is good. All these smaller ones, we just leave it. And whenever we have the time, yeah, we, go, we, we will get there, but who knows when. And this, the third part, the third way of dealing with is really acting as a manager for real with, the, with the, the problems where the managers consider quality part of everything. So quality is in the process, not out of the process. It's not something that you add. It's not an add-on to a project. Quality is part of what you are doing. So you need to care about the quality. You need to care about assuring that quality is there. So, and yeah. And the problems, every time the problems are found, they would highlight it, they would track it, they would discuss about it, and they will find the best way or the best time to deal with that, and they will be handled. So you are going to get to the end of the, the project with all the problems that you found fixed. And if there is anything that uh, you couldn't deal with or you didn't know how to fix it, this is going to be taken back to the customer or to the client. And like this, we cannot handle now because there is no time enough to handle it and etc. And this is where you guys want to be. This is where everybody should be to deliver the, the, the project prop, like, properly, right? Uh, so, and there is something like, the cost of the conformancy and non-conformancy. What do I mean by conformancy and non-conformancy? By conformancy, I mean when, when the, the company considers the quality to be part of the, of the process, they will, work, they will spend money on prevention, on conformancy, on, on being uh, prepared to handle the quality and to handle the issues. So they will spend the money investing on training people and not like in something else or not thinking about it later. And also they will think about evaluating everything. So when, it, when I say like, it's like investing time on planning tests, like is going back to the RFP phase or discovery phase and have somebody at that point already thinking about what is going to be tested in the project. Because whenever you get an RFP, if it is, it is well written, of course, you are going to easily spot what are the critical point, points or critical paths of the, the, that site or that application that you are building. So at that point, you, you may be able already to be working on that. And whenever you, you say uh, we talk about non-conformancy, we are talking about failures. So internal failures is whenever you fail internally like to execute the tests. It, and whenever you execute the tests, you find lots of issues because you didn't handle it properly in the process. It's more about thing, tests in the end of everything and not tests during the, the process. So uh, this is one thing that instead of spending money in the prevention, instead, instead of spending money in, in before to be prepared for the issues and be quicker, like to fix, 
you are now spending money on fixing it after everything is done. So this is one thing. And the other thing is the external failures is that whenever the things get to the client, so the client is going to find that issues that you guys let pass. So this is, uh, is, it has the cost of getting it back and fixing it, but may also get, have costs that are tied to legal actions. Like let's say that you, the, the issue that you guys let pass was like something that was uh, letting PII if like appear like personal identifiable information appearing like in the site plain clear and this could lead to a massive legal issue so this is where the non-conformity the fact that you didn't care about the quality is going to bite you so and talking about like points when you find the the sorry when you, where you find the bugs. Uh, the thing is that there is a huge debate, actually, if the, the cost of the fact really exists. Like, people say that it doesn't matter when you find the bug, the bug tends to have the same cost. I don't really agree with that. And if you think about the, the, the process of developing, like the SDLC of any software, like anything that you are building. There are specific phases that if you find the, 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 the bugs earlier or later, they have different costs for you to handle it because of many things. So if you go back and whenever you are analyzing the requirements, you find something that is potentially a bug because people have, like whoever wrote that requirement didn't think about some cases and you, found, you find that case back then, I, it's the cheapest one because you, you, you haven't really started to develop anything. You are just still discussing it. So there is basically no cost. The only cost that, has, that exists is like a little bit more time to write a requirement that fits what, what, whatever needs to be delivered. But as you go on, Whenever you, you are on the development phase already, if there is an uh, issue, you have developer hours already counting. So you need to, what, what hap the cost of having to fix a bug in the development phase is getting a developer to go back to that code and do whatever is necessary there. And then, you like let's say that you've developed everything and now you are integrating with other like other systems or even another site that you have developed before and etc and uh, the cost of finding issues related to the integration is uh, include the developers hours and then include the integration hours like whatever time you spend developing the, issue, the, the thing and whatever time you spend with the maybe other team or anything like that, trying to integrate the things, there are these two, these two, these two thing, uh, teams or people uh, are going to be involved on that. So it's more things, more people to pay more cost. And as whenever you find this like Later on on the testing, when, when I say testing is like the testing for the tickets passed, but whatever happened later on, it got to somebody that is going to test. Like in the case of my story, a little story before, the PM, whenever the PM got the, 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 the issue to test, it involves all the, the above. Like, so like it involves the developer hours, it involves the integration hours, and then the, the hours of the person that tested because they tested and they need to send it back and then it needs to go down again back to them. So there is more cost. And whenever it gets to UAT, if an uh, issue gets to UAT, what is the cost there? So I will go a bit faster here. When you think about it, you have hours from the developer, hours from the integration, if, if there is an integration, and then you have hours of, from the PM or 
also the QA guy that is working on that. And, and then you have time from the client, and time from the client is, it can be tricky because sometimes clients don't understand the user acceptance test as like part of the process, and they think that everything should be done whenever it gets to them. They don't understand that they are part of everything and they need to help us testing if that is what they want. And then you have the, the worst one, that is, that is finding the issue on production. So if you, if you let it pass the whole development phase, the whole testing phase, and it gets to production, you get everything that we talked about before, plus a lot of stress. So yes, I, I believe that there is cost, or there are differences between when, like, uh, related to when you find the bug. It's not like something like, oh, whenever I find the bug, I just need to go back to that guy and fix it. No, there, are, there is a lot of people involved, if there is a process, right? Sometimes there is no process, you just go back to the guy, yeah, fix that, deploy to production, whatever, and then you are in the same ship forever. So yeah, what do you need to do then? Get somebody, get a QA person, or get a team to work on QA. So they need to be dedicated to QA. It's not something like uh, just go there and train your developer to do it better. No, it's somebody that is going to really take care of that and that only. But what actually uh, mean QA? What does QA stand for? There is a discussion on what QA, like the usual thing, if you think about QA, you always talk about what you, you would always define it as quality assurance. So there is a debate talking about quality assurance and quality assistance, which is, what, what does it mean? There are two, actually, two ways of seeing it. One thing is that Quality assurance is not really right, if you think about it, because a tester is not the guy that is making sure that the quality exists. The guy that should care about the quality is the developer. The developer is the one that knows how to do that. The developer is the one that knows the best practices and etc. So he is assuring the quality. He is the one making sure that the quality exists. But the, the, the tester is more like a, a quality assistancy. Why assistance? Because he is actually assisting, uh, assisting the developer to know how to test, and after the developer does everything that they need to do, they will come and test all over again. So when you think about, uh, sorry, real quick. When you think about the process itself, uh, when you, uh, quality assurance would be something more like everybody does whatever they want to do, and in the end, the tester gets in and tests everything that was done, and yeah, pray for everything to be okay. And the quality assistance is more like, uh, like I was saying, like before the guy gets involved in the very beginning, so they, he, the tester, like the QA person, knows what is hap going to come into the, pro the, process, the, the project. So they are always touching point with the developer. They are always talking about how to test things, and they are always testing it. So when should you involve a tester or a QA or whatever? Uh, should we involve them in the RFP? For most of the cases, it is too early to involve somebody in the RFP because, yeah, sometimes the, the guy is probably involved in, in projects, so it makes no, some, lots of times it makes no sense to stop somebody that is working on something to pull the guy to a proposal which is uncertain. Like, we, we, you, we don't know if that is going to get some money or not. So it's better to not involve the guy in most of this, in most of them, because they are usually simple, like simple, quote unquote. But whenever you, got, you, you 
spot something that is very complex. Like you, you can, like everybody that work with that and deal with RFPs, you can feel when it is way too complex. And it, whenever it is way too complex, whenever it is a system, lots of integrations and etc., it is good to involve a guy from QA early at that point because you need to maybe you, you probably need to plan what are you going to do for testing because you may need new tools to test. You may need new people to test. You may, you may need to, con to hire like another, uh, an external partner to test that. So you may not have the, the ability to test it, so you need to involve somebody that can identify it quicker. Like it's, it makes no sense for you to like wait for later. But yeah, and in this discovery phase, right? The, we, we got the, like if you go back to the story that I, I said before, you got to the point where you, uh, you got the contract, you are in the, in the, the discovery phase, you need to, uh, how can I say, to understand whatever you are testing or whatever you are developing. And then, yes, that is the point where you need to for sure involve somebody that will, will test it. Because the guy is going to say, oh, this is how you, we are going to test everything. And like, develop, like defining user, car, user, sorry, user acceptance criteria and et cetera. So that is a good point. So whenever we are planning the project, the, the, the tester is going to be working closely with the technical lead to the, the project manager. And the, the role is to define the user acceptance test, and the, sorry, the criteria for the stories. And he may or may not, he, she may, may not be uh, responsible for creating the tests. There, there may be, uh, I, I've worked with teams that the, devel the developer would create the, the use cases as, the, as part of the delivery of the ticket. So they would need to provide the step-by-step -step test for the specific ticket. And then the QA person would get that one, two person, I had two people, so one would be testing that manually, and the other one would be automating that to test with everything. So yeah, that, that, this is why they, the QA person may or may not be the one holding it. And then, what the, do the developer do? So yeah, the developer, whenever, whenever a use case is, like the test cases are available, the developer is, should, the developer should be using the test case. And the, sorry, jump it, yeah, no worries. Uh, and whenever they, they provide, like they need to provide the necessary data for the tickets to be executed. And yeah, make sure that all the best practices are applied. So basically what I, I'm saying is like test early and test often. Like whenever you, you need to test, start to test as early as you can and test it as many times as you can. Because this is what will make your, your, your project successful. So whenever you are thinking about testing, the types of testing that we usually talk about is like our functional test, testing that is the usual one, just go through the functions and click around and et cetera, make sure that everything is doing whatever they are supposed to do. Then you think about the regression test that is whenever you get a ticket done, you need to get that ticket into the, the everything that was done already and test everything again to make sure that that ticket didn't break another part of the site. And then you have the smoke test. The smoke test is something that you are going to stress some critical parts of this, the, the, the project, not necessarily every single part of the, pro the process, the project. Uh, and just a, a funny thing that I, I, I didn't know before, but smoke test comes from hardware testing. So it's basically you would stress the hardware to, and check if there is smoking, smoke coming out of that. So yeah, you stress the, the critical parts and see if every, anything is going to break, right? And then I have a bunch of tools that you, you would use for that. So yeah, there are a lot of them. So I will go real quickly, quickly over all of them. So basically, one thing is lots of issues happen like because the, the site just have broken links. Something simple, something trivial, and something that you could get from, I don't know, if you use a CDN, you would see it. If you, was, you use uh, analytics, you would see it. But there are tools that could test, like ju just 
crawl through the site and click all the links for you and, and find it before you even deploy it. So it could scan your local. So that first one, uh, Xenolink, it, it's very, very old, but very, very useful. It, I don't believe it's maintained anymore in if anything, but it's very useful. And this Screaming Frog is actually, I believe it's a, a, a service. So I uh, know it's, it's, it's a tool, but they have, I believe they have a paid version of it. And then the second thing that we need to care about is testing, browser testing, but not just devices, not, not just desktop, but also mobile. So yeah, browser stack, Sauce Labs, Appium, all of them, like the, all of, now, before browser stack, like long ago, browser stack didn't have the, the devices, now they have all of them. But the Appium is actually not only for mobile, but it's not only for sites, but also for apps. So if, as part of your project, you have an app, a mobile app being built, you can use that to test the app. Like, it, you can run the app and, and run tests over it. The other thing is code quality. Uh, one thing that I, I've been using, like I've used in the later project that I had was Grum PHP, which is like a grumpy guy for PHP. And then it's like usually a pre-commit hook that will run lots of other tools that you want. So you would configure that to run like mass detector, like a more technical thing, right? So mass detector, copy and paste detector, and et cetera, to scan the, the code before the guy can commit the code. So it won't let the developer even push things that are not supposed to be pushed. So this is a good one. There, there is a lot of resistance about pre-commit hooks because, oh, it is going to slow down my development. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, quality before. So, and then site, site speed is something that, like, you can test with other ways, but, like, web page test, ping DOM, and Lighthouse, uh, all of them are very easy to use. And you can, like, for with web page tests, you can test from many points in the, the world. So you can say, like, I, can test, I want to test this page from Japan or from US or from wherever. And you can even, like, create some small scripts for doing that, clicking and filling uh, forms and et cetera. And it's free. And so it's, it's a nice one. Lighthouse, Lighthouse is something that everybody has on their Chrome browser. So just go there in the inspector, audit, and it's there available, so you can just do it. And Pingdom is similar to web page test. You can test lots of different things there. The other thing that you need to test, and it's usually hard to test, is email. So you are sending email to people. You are not testing email everywhere. So these guys will help you to test emails how are the emails going to look like in different clients? So you can use these guys to see, oh, how does it look in Outlook or you know, on Gmail or whatever? So these guys can help you with that. Uh, yeah. Um, the other thing is behavior testing. So what is behavior testing? It's basically you can script whatever the user will do in that page, right? So you go there using Behat. The, I've seen even QA people creating, like QA people that were not technical, not PHP developers, creating uh, Behat tests because it's way too simple. It's basically plain English somehow. So you can create the, 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 the Behat tests, like go, go to this page, fill this, this field, click this button, and et cetera. And then you can add this even in, like, in a, your build process and have this executing every time, or have this on your local and execute every time before you send it to, to QA for real. And it's a good thing. Uh, talking about Drupal, one thing, whoops. Uh, one thing that we have is Drutney. Uh, Drutney is basically an audit uh, tool. So you can, using Drutney, you can uh, use, there are a few policies that come with it, with it. It's, it's actually, it was actually created by Josh. Uh, and, and he's there, but I won't, I won't put him in the spot. Uh, and 
it, it actually you can create small policies about the, pro, the, the, the site in general and create profiles also. So we can test one policy would, would be like uh, test if there are modules to update. Uh, test if, uh, I don't know, there is uh, pages missing. Anonymous, how many pages do I have uh, that, uh, like accessible for anonymous pers people? And also you can pull all these policies together and create a profile that would export a, like a HTML report for you with a menu and et cetera. So it's very good to, for, for internally for you to show people, but it's also good to, to define the site readiness to be launched. So you can use that as a deliverable in the project saying like, yes, the site is fully ready for the being developed, deployed or go to, go into production. So it's a nice tool. And the last thing is load testing. Everybody needs to load test. Whenever you, you are creating a site, you need to care about uh, how many, like what is the traffic that you are going to get in that site. And you need to test for that and above. So you make sure that whenever the site goes online, like goes live for real, it's not going to go down this, the minute after, right? So. Yeah, there are like JMeter is the, the number one. BlazeMeter is basically JMeter as, as a service and has, you, you, you are more like, it's more powerful to use JMeter directly instead of use BlazeMeter. And AB is, is a very simple one, AB testing, like a, a, a benchmarking, like Apache benchmarking, which you can, you, most of uh, the developers would have in their own machines and they can test like just like uh, accessing up tons of, of hits to that page or to that site and check what is happening in the back end. So basically, yeah, in the end, you all need to get, have a, a good testing strategy and everything that is going to happen like in your project, the success of your project depends on a good approach on quality. So yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Daniel. Did anyone have any questions? We've actually got time. No. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. That was a great talk. Yeah, cool. um, I Thank think you. we might have all in our career had one time where a client has said, why do I have to pay for testing? Shouldn't the developer just do it right? How would you respond to that? Uh, yeah. It's, it's a tricky one, right? Like, yeah, the developer is going to be do it right, but it's, he is not alone doing everything. He, is, he, he, he doesn't know exactly what you want. Maybe the test that he did, he did, he did like acts like perfectly, but whatever you, want, you were expecting of the functionality is not really what he tested. So this is why we need to have somebody that is going to understand the business because we don't have time enough to, for the developer to understand the business and the, the functionality itself. So sometimes testing is no, not only about the functionality, but about the business itself. So whenever uh, the, the, I say that the QA people usually is, acts like an internal project owner, product owner, sorry. So they would understand uh, what is going to be built on Drupal or whatever, but they would, are going to understand also the business view of that. So they know exactly what the business want. And these guys are the ones that are going to create the test cases. So if we don't have that person, we don't have like, so okay, we are going to, if we don't have the people that we is going to understand the business and create the test cases, should we uh, charge more for the developer so the developer has time enough to understand the business and, and then create the proper tests? Yeah. Not really a question, but to add to what you're, what you're saying is um, I think as well testing is about how intuitive it is to complete the task or the function right and often for a developer it's a lot more intuitive for them to do something that they just wrote the way that they thought it was supposed to be done and then a, a, a QA person is going to think about it completely different and that's kind of the value of that testing process of having somebody else do it or having more people involved in that testing process because Developers inevitably just deliver what they think needed to be done, yeah. and they t when they they do test it right, but it just works the way they expected yeah, it to work. They are always feeling 
filling out the forms with the right things and then filling out the forms with the wrong things whenever they want this to fail. But the tester is going to fail it with whatever because they have a crazy imagination. Go for it. As someone who's mostly on the client side of these things, mm -hmm. what are some good signs, I guess, in a proposal that, um, that, a, that a vendor's got a good handle on this? Uh, yeah, usually the, I, I, uh, it's hard to say from the proposal. I would say that it's more about meeting and talking because proposal, like paper accepts anything. You can just get something that, uh, like a, a random test, text and add there because yes, this is what everybody is talking about in QA. I've, been, I've seen that before, like people getting other companies' proposals, taking, looking at whatever the guys are read, writing and write the same thing or write something similar. So yeah, right, the proposal itself, like the document, I don't believe it's a way to, to, man, to see it. It's more about talking to the person, like to the team and say, like, what are you guys really doing? Because they are going to like, say or not. Like, you are they are going to show if they know what they are talking about. Cool, is there anyone else? Yeah. Probably last question. Sorry. Thanks. Um, what do you think makes a good quality assistance person? Like if, if you are hiring someone for QA, what are the key things that you would look for? Uh, one thing is that the person should not be afraid of make other people cry. <laughs> <laughs> because yes, lots of times I, I, I usually to, I used to, to fight like fight with our, our QA people and like pick on them, but I believe that the QA person should be somebody that uh, can do whatever they want inside the project because they are like the, the guys that are acting throughout the project to make sure that everything is going right. So even more than the PM, because the PM is, yeah, he is there or he, she is there, but they are also thinking about business and thinking about budget and be thinking about other things. The QA person is only thinking about quality. So you need to make sure that this person is like able to, to go to somebody and call that person and say, oh, you, this is wrong and we need to do it right this, like this and not like that, but also in a respectful way, right? Because there are guys that are very, not a people person, right? <laughs> Um, and if you don't mind me adding, I see QA as being responsibility of the entire team. So even though you know the QA person is, has their responsibilities, yep. it should be top of mind for everyone in the team. Um, we have to end it there. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you all. Um, it's now morning. Tea.